Hey everyone, I hope you're all safe and well. I'm so gutted that I didn't get to upload last week. I was just really, really sick. I couldn't even look at screens. I had the worst migraine. It was not nice. But because I had a bit more time to look into this, I found so much more stuff that I didn't even know existed. So it's kind of worked out for the best. So this case isn't quite as unknown as my last two cases. I just didn't really know about it. A lot of my family suggested this case to me when it became a drama on ITV. And yet I'd never heard about it before. It's really, really puzzling when you take everything into account. It's confusing. But there's a lot of information on this case and I'm gonna do my absolute best to include as much as I can. Obviously I could probably speak about this for about five hours. There's just so much to include. So I'm going to do my absolute best to be able to summarise it all for you and include as much information as I can. So I hope I'm not like jumping around and moving all through this video, but my dog has been very naughty today and she won't let me film. So this is the case of the White House farm murders, which took place on the 6th of August in 1985 in Darcy in Essex, UK. Five members of the same family were shot in the early hours of the morning in the farmhouse. There was two six-year-old boys and three adults. Two of the people murdered that day were June and Neville Bamber. They were both married in 1949 and they were really, really well liked by everyone in the community. They were a really respected family. Neville was quite outgoing and had lots of friends and June was still really, really well liked but she was a bit more shy and reserved. June was really, really involved in the church and they were both very religious. Neville was a farmer and everyone knew him. June and Neville unfortunately weren't able to have their own children so this really, really affected June. In 1955, June unfortunately had a breakdown and she was treated in a psychiatric hospital for depression and that was brought on by not being able to conceive. In February of 1958, June and Neville decided to adopt a baby girl through the church and unfortunately June wasn't able to bond with the baby so that just carried her depression on and by the end of the year she was back in hospital. June started on a course of ECT, which stands for Electroconvulsive Therapy, I hope I'm saying that right, and that is used to treat depression, suicidal thoughts, and it was a lot more common in those times than it is now. ECT involves sending electric currents through your brain and it kind of causes little seizures from what I understand. The aim of the treatment is to relieve some mental health problems and it's done while you're asleep. ECT is quite controversial because in the past it has been used either without consent or without anaesthetic and it can cause memory loss. It's been shown in a lot of films in a horrific way so it's quite a controversial treatment. June recovered eventually and was sent home and then in 1961 they adopted a little boy called Jeremy. Neville and June Bamber got a nanny for the children and everything seemed to be going really really well for them. Sheila was a pretty sensitive child and she said that her mum and dad give her everything but they didn't give her any physical affection and she said that really upset her. And Jeremy or Jem as he was sometimes known was just a happy child, he was fine. But when they were seven, they were told that they were adopted and they both took it very differently. Sheila was really, really upset about it and Jeremy just wasn't really bothered. He didn't seem to care, but he did start to resent his parents for adopting him. Sheila and Jeremy were both sent to boarding schools by the mum and dad because the family were quite well off. But during this time in boarding school, Jeremy was teased by the boys and there's even reports to say that Jeremy was sexually abused. And Jeremy's behaviour started to get really bad. He was quite sulky. He was described as being a brat. He'd enjoy hurting all the animals around the farm and just not very nice things like that. Jeremy had a lot of feelings of neglect and abandonment, probably through finding out that he was adopted and also being sent to boarding school where he was abused. And I think he maybe felt like he was being sent away by his mum and dad and he just wasn't happy about it. So in 1974, Sheila was sent to a college in London and Jeremy was to stay on the farm because he would take over it once his dad was gone. Sheila dropped out of college about a year later and she really wanted to pursue a modelling career, but this didn't go down very well with her religious mum. Sheila met Colin Cathell in 1974 and she became pregnant, which again, June was very happy about. And she actually called Sheila the devil's child, which really, really upset her, especially because of how religious June was, it meant a lot. Even though it may have just been a passing comment, it was a very serious thing to say for someone who was that religious and it really, really did upset Sheila. Unfortunately, Sheila lost a few babies and she was really upset, it really played on her mind. She wanted nothing more than to be a mum 
and she thought that God was punishing her in some way. Sheila became pregnant with twins in 1979 and she was really, really happy. She was determined to be a good mum, but unfortunately when she had the twins, her marriage with Colin wasn't doing that well and they ended up getting a divorce. The two twins were called Nicholas and Daniel and they were just described as being full of laughter. They're absolutely lovely little boys. At this point Jeremy was still working on the farm and he'd go about his farm jobs in strange clothes as they were described which was like new romantics kind of clothes and makeup. All of his family just thought that he wanted attention. Colin was always around to help look after the kids, he was a really really good dad and June always helped too. June and Neville bought Sheila and the twins a flat so they had somewhere to live because of course Sheila wasn't with Colin anymore. So it's said at this point that Jeremy was really starting to resent Sheila because of all the attention she was getting from her mum and dad. They were always constantly worried about her, they were buying her a flat, they were looking after her kids, they were just all about Sheila and Jeremy felt a bit pushed out. So he started to rebel a bit and went out drinking a lot. In 1981, Jeremy actually got into a relationship with a divorced lady who had three kids and was old enough to be his mum, which didn't go down well with June and Neville. They actually threatened him with being disinherited if he didn't end the relationship. June at this point was really starting to struggle. She was looking after Sheila's little boys a lot. She was struggling with her own mental health and her religious views were getting more and more extreme. She even stopped church raffles because she thought that they could be viewed as gambling. She didn't want anything to do with that kind of thing. In May 1982, she was diagnosed with paranoid psychosis and she was sent back to hospital and given more ECT. Jeremy went to New Zealand that year as well and he'd already been to Australia before, both trips funded by his mum and dad. Jeremy had got into some trouble in Australia before and Neville had had to send money over to fix it but it's not really said what it was. Jeremy was starting to become a bit of a nuisance for the family, you know, he was going out with people they didn't like, he was drinking, he was dressing funny as they say and he was, you know, getting into trouble abroad. All things that could bring shame onto the family and they didn't like that at all. When he came back from New Zealand, his behaviour was just even worse and he was causing more and more trouble for the family. Meanwhile, Sheila had been listening a lot to her mum. Sheila started dwelling on thoughts about the devil and God and she was showing signs of psychosis and delusional thoughts. Eventually, Sheila was sent to the same hospital that June had been sent to and she was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. She told doctors about the devil child comment that June had made to her and she said that she needed an exorcism. She believed the devil was inside her. So Sheila was put on antipsychotics and was also given ECT. Sheila was released in 1983 and Colin was really, really understanding of the whole situation. He was really helpful. He had the boys full time. He really still liked Sheila and he just wanted her to get better. He was just concerned for her. So Sheila's treatment made her numb and drowsy and she really, really didn't like it and actually asked for it to be halved. And the GP agreed to this until she could see a psychiatrist again. Jeremy again was really, really angry of all the attention Sheila was getting, especially because now she'd been admitted to hospital and each stay apparently cost them around £8,000 in today's money. So Jeremy, thought straight away, that's coming out of my inheritance, I'm not happy about that. So Colin drove Sheila down to White House Farm so she could go and stay with her mum and dad for a little bit and with the boys. The kids loved watching the farm animals and it was just meant to be a nice little break for them. The day before the murders, Jeremy and his dad Neville had been both working on the farm and Sheila and June took the kids into the nearby village. Jeremy said that they'd all had a little dinner together, it was all quite nice until the conversation came up about Sheila maybe not being able to manage her sons. Jeremy said that June and Neville were actually suggesting foster care through the church to Sheila and Sheila was having absolutely none of it. She just wasn't responding, she was just staring blankly and he said she was just like a zombie. So while this conversation was happening, Jeremy said that he was eating a sandwich over the sink and he could see rabbits in the back garden. So he took a rifle, loaded it, went and he said as he went to go out, he either realised it was too dark or he just decided against going to shoot the rabbits. So he put the rifle by the front door and he said from where Sheila was sitting at the kitchen table, she'd have been able to see where the rifle had been put down. Jeremy worked at his parents' farm but he lived about three miles away. So Jeremy went home, went to bed and then about three in the morning he received a call from his dad. The call said, please help, your sister's gone crazy, she's got one of my guns and she's going berserk. Then Jeremy said that the phone just completely went dead and he started to panic. 
So at 3.36, the police received a call from Jeremy describing the call that he'd just had from his dad and saying that he was really, really worried and to get someone down to the farm as soon as possible. Jeremy tried to call back, but he said he couldn't get through. So when he spoke to the police, he was advised to go and meet them there. So the person who first picked up the phone was actually at the police station and he forwarded Jeremy's call onto the civilian dispatcher. A squad car was then dispatched with three officers in and they all arrived at White House Farm at about 10 to 4 in the morning. On the way to the farm they said that they passed a car that was driving really really slowly and they had to overtake it to get to the farm as quick as they could. When they got there they said that the car they passed was actually Jeremy Bamba driving up to the farm. So the police officers and Jeremy are all at the scene. They're at White House Farm and they're waiting outside. And at the moment, there's three logs being taken. There's the event log, the radio log, and the scene log. And these are all different logs being taken by different people. The police were following procedure and they were trying to contact whoever may be alive inside the house. They said there's either five dead bodies in there or there's four dead bodies and someone with a gun. They believe that there might have been a hostage situation and they had to try and talk the person down who may still have a gun. As they were waiting outside, Jeremy and a couple of other police officers were said to have seen something upstairs moving around and Jeremy said that he saw someone in the window and then they ran away. They'd asked Jeremy how many guns were in the house and it was a farmhouse and Jeremy just said there's, there's loads. The officers tried to ring the house to see if anyone picked up inside, if anyone was still alive and the phone was ringing, it hadn't died or been cut off as Jeremy had said. They asked Jeremy to draw a floor plan of the house just so they knew when they went in what they were facing. Just knowing where the rooms all were would give them the best opportunity of going through the house safely and knowing what they were going into. Eventually more officers arrived and because these officers were armed they decided it was safe to go in to see what was going on and it had been four hours and they hadn't had any communication from inside the house so they thought it was unlikely that it was a hostage situation. At 7.35am the officers walked towards the house and through the window one of the officers said that he could see a woman who was lying dead in the kitchen. He said that she was bent at a really really weird angle. When they went in they found out that it was actually Neville Bamba. It was Jeremy's dad who was in the kitchen and he'd been shot while he was sitting down. The officers went upstairs to check all the other bedrooms and they found the two boys Nicholas and Daniel who'd been shot while they were sleeping and one of the little boys was actually still sucking his thumb. Just makes me really, really sad. June, who was Jeremy's mum, was found in the bedroom upstairs. She was out of bed and she was on the floor. She'd also been shot. Sheila was also lying on the other side of the bed. She'd been shot twice and she had an open Bible next to her and she was holding the rifle in her hand. The house was locked from the inside and there wasn't any sign of forced entry, so they thought straight away that it was a murder-suicide. So Jeremy had been told to expect the worst but when officers told him he completely broke down, he was screaming, crying, he was devastated. Straight away the police were convinced that this was a murder-suicide, there was no forced entry, it didn't look like anyone else was involved, Sheila was there holding a gun, she had a history of mental health problems. It just looked like that's exactly what had happened. But the family liaison officer, Stan Jones, was really suspicious of Jeremy from the beginning. He said that once Jeremy had found out about the murders and he'd had his cry, he went home and Stan Jones watched him make and eat a bacon sandwich. I just thought it was really weird how casual he was about it. So the news had travelled pretty fast about what had happened on the farm and the press had already turned up and made a story that Sheila had shot and killed her mum, dad and her two sons. Because there wasn't any evidence at that point to suggest that it wasn't a murder-suicide, a lot of things were removed from the house and the house wasn't given a proper forensic investigation. They took out bloodstained carpets, wallpaper and a few other items because they thought that Jeremy would have to go back in and didn't want those memories there, didn't want you know the blood of his family all over his house. So they were trying to just make it nice for him and clean up a bit. Stan Jones and a few other people were still really suspicious of Jeremy and they didn't want any of the stuff removed but it had already been ordered. Sheila had been shot twice in the neck and both of those shots could have been fatal. The pathologist who looked at all the bodies afterwards said that it's not unheard of for someone committing suicide to shoot themselves twice but he'd already been told that it was murder-suicide so he had no reason to look into it in any other way. Sheila was also really clean considering what had happened and what she was expected to have just done. She had a light coloured nighty on and the only blood on her was coming from the two gunshot wounds and it was her own blood. She didn't have any splashes on her of anyone else's blood. She didn't have any messed up nails. She had a 
perfect red manicure. She was meant to have had a big scuffle with her dad in the kitchen and then shot three other people. The bullets that have been shot were covered in like a greasy substance and there was 25 bullets so the gun would have had to have been reloaded and Sheila didn't have any of that under her nails or on her hands either. Neville had eight shots. Neville's blood had been found in the bedroom so he would have had to have been shot there as well. The two shots in the temple were meant to be the fatal ones so that means he would have started to have been shot in the bedroom but then went down and was shot fatally in the kitchen. Between being shot in the bedroom and going downstairs to the kitchen, that's when Neville would have had to have called Jeremy to tell him what was going on. But there was no blood on the phone and also if one of those shots was anywhere around his head or his mouth, like he wouldn't have been able to really talk. The keys to White House Farm were given back to the close family, including Jeremy. It was Jeremy and a couple of cousins and an uncle. They all went in to see what was there and to see if they could find any more clues basically. They really wanted to know what had happened and what had gone on that night. While they were looking around the house they actually found a silencer from a gun under the stairs and it had blood on it, a hair and another red substance. They decided to keep it to themselves for a bit and then take it to one of their houses, tell the police and then it took the police three days to pick it up and it was actually kept in like a toilet roll so it'd been passed through so so many people and probably damaged a lot of the evidence on it. The hair on it as well was completely lost so they weren't able to test that to see whose it was. So the blood did match Sheila's but it could also have been a mixture of quite a few people's blood and the other red stuff on it was a match with the paint that was on the mantelpiece in the kitchen where Neville and whoever had had the gun had had a fight. That means that the silencer would have had to have been on the gun during the murder. The blood was found in the silencer but not in the rifle. Whoever had used the silencer had put it back in the cupboard afterwards. When the police tested out the length of the gun with the silencer on it, if Sheila had the gun up to her neck and had held it out and pulled the trigger, she wouldn't have been able to reach. It made the gun far too long. So then they thought it couldn't have been Sheila. Suspicions at this time as well were getting really, really bad around Jeremy again. He was desperate to cremate the bodies of Jude, Neville and Sheila. He really seemed to just want them gone, want to destroy any evidence. At the funeral, there were a lot of cameras and a lot of press there. And it was said that he walked out the church. He put on a massive performance of being really upset, really sad, just absolutely devastated. And then as soon as the cameras were gone, he was fine. Colin had said that in the car on the way to the crematorium he was speaking to his girlfriend just joking with her and being rude with her and just an attitude you wouldn't have on the funeral of your mum, dad and sister. Colin's mum had also said that Jeremy didn't seem to be grieving and that she'd actually ran into him in Colin's house and Jeremy had his hair spiked up and he was copying a picture of the two kids in the bath like he'd spiked the hair up with shampoo and he was running around giggling then he bumped into her and acted really sad. Julie Mugford who is Jeremy's girlfriend was a school teacher and she really really loved Jeremy but Jeremy really liked the attention of other girls he was a bit of a ladies man and Julie really didn't like that. Shortly after the funeral Jeremy actually went on holiday with a friend to France and he dumped Julie. Julie went straight to the police and she told them everything Jeremy had told her. She said on multiple occasions Jeremy had said about how he'd like to get rid of his family. Before the murders took place he'd called Julie and said oh tonight's the night I'm gonna do it and she was just like, yeah, okay, whatever. Like, apparently he'd said it a lot. After he'd made the phone call to the police, he rang Julie again and told her that it was done, but she didn't say anything to the police. He told Julie that he'd actually hired a hitman to kill his family and that he didn't do it himself, but the police believe he was able to get in through a small downstairs window, commit the murder, and then go back home on his bike. The headlights wouldn't have been seen, like no one would have seen a car. They wouldn't know that anyone had gone to the farm in that time if he went on his bike. So on the 25th of September, the police decided that they had enough evidence to arrest Jeremy for the murder of his family. And on the 29th, while he was on the way back from France, he was arrested. He was interviewed and charged, and a lot of it was because of what Julie had said to the police, but Jeremy said that Julie was just looking for revenge and she was just angry that he'd broken up with her. Jeremy's trial lasted 19 days and everyone said that he was trying to come across as being a really nice man, really polite. Julie was actually the one to testify against Jeremy in court and it was really intense because the jury just had to pick basically which one of them they believed. 
The main evidence used in the trial was the blood in the silencer and the fact that Neville had two gunshot wounds around his mouth and wouldn't have been able to make that call to Jeremy. Jeremy didn't call 999, he actually went into his phone book, looked up the number of the local police station and made the call that way. He didn't just ring for an emergency. In the phone book it says, if this is emergency, ring 999, but he didn't. But he said he thought that that would make officers go out quicker if it was a local police station, but they just found that really, really strange that in an emergency you wouldn't call the emergency line. The jury at first couldn't come to a decision, it was just so hard to know which person to believe. After the jury was sent out again, they actually found him guilty 10 to 2 on all of the murders. He was given five life sentences and the judge called him evil beyond belief. Jeremy's currently around 35 years into his sentence, but his lawyers have actually launched a challenge saying that there's evidence that's been withheld and wasn't brought up in his trial. And they were all from the various logs that were taken that morning. So the first thing is that there were actually two calls that were taken down this morning in the logs. There was one that was listed at 3.25 and there was one that was listed at 3.35. They were both from different people and one of them was from Neville Bamber who said, my daughter's going mad with a gun, please help me. The second one was from Jeremy saying, my dad's just called saying, my sister's going mad with a gun, please help him. Only the one from Jeremy was ever brought up. Two documents say that a silencer was found on September the 11th and then another one was actually found a month beforehand. So there were two silencers found but only one was brought up in the case. The records show as well that the police had actually searched all the cupboards and the silencer wasn't found at that time so why was it found by the family later on? The police photographer who took pictures of the crime scene actually wasn't able to pick up any of the scratches on the mantelpiece. That was just told them later by the family. There was no sign of any debris or anything coming off the mantelpiece and that would have been there when the original photos were taken. If the scratch wasn't on the mantelpiece then a huge part of Jeremy's trial was meant to be wrong because Sheila couldn't have fought off Neville. He was ex-army and he was massive. The enzyme that was found in the blood as well that was in the silencer can also be found in rabbits. They also said at the crime scene that they could hear something moving around upstairs. Jeremy's lawyers also point out that in the logs there was a clear message that said that they were trying to contact someone who was alive in the house at around five in the morning and the logs say that someone was alive in the house. Also, when they found Sheila, they said that there was still blood running from her wounds, so she might not have been dead for as long as they thought. But a lot of this can be debunked. Firstly, the police kind of handled a lot of this really, really poorly. They got a lot of mixed messages. However, they did correct themselves, but when they're written down in logs like that, it makes things look a bit suspicious. The police had actually reported two bodies downstairs and three upstairs when it was actually one body downstairs and four upstairs. They'd said that there was a female found in the kitchen and they say that that could have been Sheila and she could have been in the kitchen, gone up a flight of stairs at the side of the house and then died in the bedroom. Well, that's kind of unlikely to me. The mix-up of the female in the kitchen was that the first officer who looked through the window and saw the scene said that there was a woman bent at a weird angle and she was dead in the kitchen. But when they actually got closer, they realised it was Neville. But just because of the way Neville's body was, the officer just thought it was a woman. So that's when it became, there's a woman, then there's a man. So that made two bodies. Whereas in reality, it was just a man and he just got mixed up. The two calls that were made that were from Neville and Jeremy, they were actually both from Jeremy and one of the people who took the calls wrote the time down wrong as 10 minutes before. And the way it was written down is as though it's being said by Neville, whereas in reality it was just Jeremy telling them what his dad had said. The call log makes it look like it's come from Neville. The fact that they were talking to someone inside the house and that's shown on the logs, that is just procedure for hostage situations. They will try and talk people down from shooting any more people or to let the people go who they're holding hostage. So there wasn't actually anyone seen to be alive in the house, there was no communication made. It was just procedure. But again, on the logs, it looks like there's someone alive in the house and there never was as far as police know. What I did see in one documentary though was that the silencer on the end of the gun and them saying that Sheila couldn't reach, she actually may have been able to reach that. However, if the silencer was found in the cupboard, it would have meant that she would have shot herself 
took the silencer, put it back in the cupboard downstairs and then came back up to die, which I don't think is very likely. So that's pretty much all of the evidence I have and everything that happened. I really hope I didn't miss anything out and I hope you can understand it because it is so crazy. And as I said, at the moment, Jeremy is behind bars. He's doing five life sentences. I think there are a lot of things that need to be questioned. The main motive for these murders was meant to be inheritance. If Jeremy killed his parents and Sheila, that I mean it would all go to him. But if Jeremy's in jail, I think all the inheritance and the farm would go to the cousins. And to me, that's really suspicious as well. I know they can't help inheriting, but the whole them finding the silence thing after it was meant to have been searched by the police, I find a little strange, but I'm not sure. I think Jeremy is the most likely person to have done it, but I don't think he was given a fair trial. Even if he is guilty, I don't think he was given a fair trial. There is so much evidence and logs and things that just weren't brought up and I think that's really unfair to him. Again, even if he did do it, I'm not supporting him. I'm not supporting anyone, but I don't think his trial was fair. So my mind's still going a bit mad with all this information. It's just all a bit crazy and confusing. And I don't think anyone will ever actually know exactly what happened on that night. I really hope you've enjoyed this video. I've loved researching it, watching all the things about it, reading all the things about it. If you haven't already watched the ITV series, it's really good. People who made the ITV drama worked with a lot of people who worked on the case itself, so a lot of the information is completely true. There is a disclaimer though at the beginning that says some scenes and characters have been made up, but I've taken most of my information from documentaries and podcasts and articles. Hopefully I've got all the information right. Please do your own research, it's really interesting and it's very confusing as you can probably tell, but definitely watch the drama series, it is very good. Please like and subscribe, I hate saying that so much, but yeah, please like and subscribe. It helps me a lot and it helps me grow and that's what we want. Cause I'm only five foot one. Thank you so so much for watching and I will see you in my next one. Bye!